Hello and welcome back to the academic track of Phosphor G 2021. Uh, we are about to start the last uh, uh, talk of this uh, session of the first day of the conference and the next speaker that I have the pleasure to introduce is Mariela Reinberg. She has a degree in applied mathematics. Uh, currently, she is a doctoral student at the Laboratory of Remote Sensing and Ecology at the University of uh, San Martin in Argentina. And she's currently working on the classification of vegetation cover in wetlands using SAR images. And uh, her talk is titled Land Cover Classification Using Freely Available uh, Multi-Temporal SAR Data Work in Progress. Uh, Mariela, over to you for the presentation. Hello, thank you very much, Marco. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers, the Phosphor She organizer. And well, this is, today I'm going to present a joint work made together with Rafael Grinson, Juan Lucas Valli, Priscilla Minotti, and Patricia Candus. We work in the Institute of Investigation and Environmental Engineering at the University of San Martin in Argentina. As Marco told before, I'm going to present this work, which is titled is Land Cover Classification Using Freely Available Multitemporal SAR Data. So, first of all, I wanted to start telling you a little bit about how SAR uh, synthetic upper two radars work. These are radar systems that usually go over um, aircraft or spacecraft. And the way they generate the images is by sending an electromagnetic wave that interacts with the Earth's surface. And after interacting with the surface, a portion of this electromagnetic wave uh, returns to the SAR, and the SAR captures this echo. These are active systems. This means that they do not need from external source sources to get information. So, um, sorry. <laughs> In, so they can take images during the day and also during the night. Also, these uh, electromagnetic waves operate in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this makes them possible to take images even when the, there's presence of clouds or rains. Um, these electromagnetic waves will, be, uh, will interact with the media and will have different scattering mechanisms according to the presence of water, to the geometry of the, of the observed surface and other characteristics. Here I wanted to show that perhaps we are seeing some vegetation and when we have the flooded, the same vegetation, the mechanism is going to be different and we are going to have differences in the images. The images, the SAR images that I'm going to use are Sentinel-1 that are offered by the Spatial Agency, sorry, the European Spatial Agency. They are available since 2014 and 2016, the Sentinel-1B. And it's the first time that we have freely SAR available data with a short revisit time. This instrument is a C-band. This means that the the wavelength is about 5 uh, kilohertz, and it supports uh, dual polarization. BB and BH is what I'm going to be using. If you want to download or get more information, you can visit this link in the Copernicus. So, which is the objective of my study? I'm going to study how we can use these SAR multi-temporal data to generate vegetation cover maps in a specific place in Argentina that is characterized by being a wetland and a very densely vegetated wetlands. My study area here on the left, I'm showing the southern part of South America. And here is Argentina. Here is located my study area. And on the right side, we can see the, a portion of the lower delta of the Paraná River. This, this wetland is characterized by being, um, having a humid and temperate climate 
and it's also this zone is admitted to tidal regime, so the floodings are hardly to predict. They, we cannot predict when they are going to occur. There are some exceptions. Specifically, I'm going to work with these over these uh, islands and taking into account previous works, we expect the uh, profile like the one that I'm showing you in, on the right. What I want to say here is that if we walk from the water to inside of the different islands, what we expect is first to have uh, an amount of sediments and have a leaves and over the leaves have different types of forest. We suppose or we expect that the dominant classes here are going to be willow plantations. Then when we go through the island, we can find other types of forest, um, like sable forest. The sable forest can be found isolated or it can be found with underneath vegetation, like, for example, Cortadera marshes that are these that I'm showing you here. And when we get the center of the islands, where the soil is usually saturated, we can find these, these Cortadera marshes. Also, in the borders of the water courses, we usually find these junco marshes that with this vertical structure. So the hypothesis of this work is that uh, in this area, there are five, classi uh, five classes that dominate the sea, the water and the four vegetation classes that I mentioned before. To continue with this analysis, what we did was uh, we took about 100 samples per class. This means that I have 100 places that are being labeled with each of the classes. And I'm going to use this information. To get these labeled places, what we did was to use previous works in the area, experts of in vegetation in the area, and we also use uh, two planet uh, scope images. So I have the level data or the sample data, and I'm going to use also this Sentinel-1 data. Here in the images, I'm showing the two examples of different polarizations, the VH and the VB that I'm going to use. And I'm using a total of 76 images corresponding to October 2016 to April 2019 in both polarizations, and here are more details. When we work with SAR images, we have to do a lot of pre-processing. And in this study, we follow the Filipponi's uh, workflow proposed in her work, Sentinel-1 GRD pre-processing workflow, where he proposed first to apply the orbit to each of the images, then make some noise removal associated to thermal and to border removal, do a calibration, speckle filter filtering, Terrain flight, i sorry, terrain flattening, terrain correction, and in the last place we've got for every polarization and for every date, um, pixels values that represent the backscatter value for each data and polarization. All this analysis was done in the SNAP uh, software that is freely available by the um, uh, European Space Agency. Here, uh, I wanted to show a little bit how these classes, uh, this mean scatter values classes, so for each date and each of the sample data, I calculated the mean scatter values and also the deviation. Here we can see that there is one class that is that this that is over here that's a little bit separated from the others. And the other three vegetation classes show some difference in some dates, for example, here, or we can find some difference over here. But uh, this difference uh, occur during winter. But when we plot also the standard deviation, we see that they have a lot of overlapping. So identifying these classes seems to be hard and difficult to do. At this point, I was only using the temporal information, but I also wanted to use, for each pixel, the spatial relationship with uh, 
their neighbors. Sometimes it can happen when we are uh, studying uh, two areas of interest, of interest, and when we calculate some statistics, like the mean values from each of the areas of interest, they have the same mean value. But the distributions of the values in each of them could be different. And that is what we want to capture with the uh, texture measurements. They are going to give us information about the context of each pixel. And one way to calculate texture measurements are those based on the grade level co-occurrence matrix. And they are very used in remote sensing and they are already implemented in SNAP toolbox. There are a lot of texture measurements that can be calculated based on the GLCM uh, matrix. We decided to follow Hal Bayer, uh, works and she proposed to use the contrast, variance, entropy, and correlation texture measurements. Once we did all these calculations, the preprocessing, we create different data sets. We wanted to evaluate which data set was useful for creating vegetation cover maps in this context. So um, we create a total of 30 data sets. Each data set has a corresponding set of dates a corresponding uh, type of polarization and a corresponding pixels value. Uh, this means that we could use for each data set just the backscatter values or the backscatter values together with G the GLCM values. What I mean here is together with the textures values. All this analysis was done using Python, using GDAL library in Python, and well, there were a lot of libraries like NumPy and Pandas that were also used in this analysis. Then, once we create all the different data sets, we we want to make sorry we want to make uh, classifications with each of them. So we decided to use the random forest classifier because it's a uh, very well known that it gives good results, it's resistant to outliers, and it can be trained with uh, small data sets. So for each of the data sets, we uh, create a random forest model. This random forest model was created by selecting, by doing a grid search. And then once when we have the best random forest classifier trained for each of the data sets, we evaluated over the same test set all the models. And then we, um, the, the, the way that we evaluated was analyzing the overall accuracy and the kappa index values. All these, in, all these models, adjusting and implementations were done using the scikit-learn library in Python. And as a result, one of our uh, one of our objectives was to analyze if it was useful to use textures. And what we noticed is that in all the cases, using the textures give us better results. When we compare <coughs> data sets associated to intensity values or backscatter values uh, that gave us good results, like kappa indexes uh, higher than a 0 0.9. And when we applied to them, or sorry, well, uh, the textures, we noticed that they got better results, but the results were like at least a 3% better. In the cases that we had using the, the backscatter values and we got kappa index values lower than 0 0.8, when we incorporate the textures, the increment in the kappa index values and overall accuracy was um, like at least an 8% greater. Here, I wanted to show you some classifications. Uh, in all the cases, I'm using just the BH polarization. For the first are the summer dates, the winter, and the complete set of dates. In all the cases I'm using for the classification, I use the variables associated to the backscatter and also to the textures. And as we can see here, the summer data sets show a very noisy pattern. It doesn't seem to uh, show what we were expecting, this profile that I showed you before. 
On the other hand, in the winter and in the complete data set, we can find that pattern if we walk from the water to the center of the islands, we can find first an area that is covered by different kinds of forests, and then we have the Corpadera marshes. And in most of the uh, water courses, we can find Hung. Also, we can observe that winter and complete data sets give us very similar kappa values and overall accuracies, but also when we see the classification, we, it's hard to find some differences. There are some differences, but are few of them. Another analysis that we decided to do is that when you use a uh, video uh, random forest, it is possible to make a variable uh, analysis, variable importance analysis. This means that it's possible to score the data sets variable according to its usefulness in, the, in predicting the target classes. So we can use random forest to get a ranking, and that ranking is about the variables that were used in the model, which were most useful to which are the less useful. And what we observed when we did this, when we did this analysis over the complete data set in the BB in the BH polarization uh, was that the most useful dates were associated to intensity of backscatter values in the winter or autumn dates. And uh, it's not in this slide, but the lowest or the less useful variables were associated all with the entropy texture. So perhaps incorporating this texture is not so useful. So as conclusion, um, we, in this analysis, we saw that using the winter data set gives us results as good as using the complete data set, but what is good of using just the winter dates, multi-temporal winter dates, is that we are using less uh, a less amount of images. Also, the inclusion of textures give us better results. And what we have to analyze is if it was necessary to include these um, entropy texture measurements. Also, for future work, we would like to, uh, to work also with a multi-temporal L-band uh, data that is very suitable for this type of wetlands. So we hope now with SOCOM we could have this, this data and do this analysis. Here I put some information about the bibliography, if it's of your interest, and I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Mariela, for this very interesting uh, uh, talk and application of SAR uh, images. Um, I invite the audience to ask questions um, to Mariela. In the meantime, I just read the first one uh, that came a while ago, and it was about uh, uh, random forest. Uh, um, in which software did you uh, uh, run the random forest classifier? Okay, I use uh, the Scikit library. Oh, sorry, Scikit Learn library in Python. Thanks. This That's I think good. answers the the question. Um, uh, second question, a new one. Why do you think, so this is related to the, to the conclusion, so why do you think that including texture features improves classification accuracy? Um, I think that it improves because I was using a per pixel strategy, so I was not taking advantage of the context of each pixel. And it happens many times that when we observe forests, the information is there, is that the difference between the, your neighbors. So I, I guess it's about that, the special relationship. Thanks a lot, Mariel. I hope this answers the question. This is not definitely my field, so I, 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 I hope it does. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, otherwise, of course, we, we invite the, the, the people who ask questions to further ask uh, questions in the, in the, in the chat. Um, Okay, other questions coming. Uh, can the SNAP pre-processing steps be included in your Python workflow? 
Um, yes, I tried with a library, a uh, Python library called Pyrosar that wrapped that preprocessing. So if you would like, it was really fast to do it with that library. So I guess it would help. Good. So that you might consider this uh, uh, for the future uh, work. Um, mm -hmm. Another question in the meantime, did you consider to incorporate optic uh, satellites or uh, yeah, optical images, I guess, uh, to the analysis? Um, yes, uh, I was main focused in, Senti um, in SAR and I came like with the SAR. Uh, okay, I was thinking about SAR, but I will incorporate. There are sometimes like in summer, but the same happens with short wavelengths like C-band, that in summer there's a lot of vegetation and information about the underneath vegetation is very difficult to get with optical images. That was why I was interested in SAR. But I guess that combin uh, making a combination of a little bit of SAR and uh, optical would be great. Yeah, indeed. Um, so there are no other questions, but I still invite the audience to ask uh, if they wish. So in the meantime, maybe I can ask uh, something just out of, of curiosity. Um, you used images from 2016 to 2019. I just I was just wondering whether there is a reason for that and not for using more uh, recent uh, ones uh, or just to extend the, the, the interval. And uh, uh, the second one is really a curiosity. Uh, so you use Sentinel-1 uh, data sets, uh, but I was wondering uh, what would happen uh, if using other uh, images and why if this is just an experiment, if this is due to the uh, specific characteristics uh, like the high frequency rate or like the open access uh, to the Sentinel-1 images or whether there are other reasons for, for that. Thanks. Okay. Um, I was interested in using uh, well, Sentinel-1 in particular, because first they are free. We are, I work in a laboratory that explores or monitors wetlands. So SAR images are very important. And using that, perhaps if I use another type of image like ALOS-2, for example, then I want to replicate this, uh, this study in other places and I cannot find the available data. So what is great, I think, of Sentinel-1 is that I can cover all the places that I want. And I forgot, sorry, the first one. Ah, the, okay. The, well, something, it's like this. These, in this case, I download all the images and I start working with Sentinel-1 in 2019. And when I took to April, in April, June, July, I couldn't find images from this place. Then I could get again images, I think in September 2019. And so I did like a stop there. I analyzed if just need winter or need summer or all those things. But well, I guess now I'm going to include 2020 that there are the images and 2021 too. <laughs> Good. Thanks a lot for the for the answers, um, Mariela. Uh, looking at the uh, chat, I do not see additional questions, so I think we can uh, wrap up and close uh, not only the talk but the whole academic track session. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to chair this session. I would like to thank Mariela uh, and uh, the audience, uh, Mariela, for the great presentation and for answering the questions, and of course the audience for their uh, good uh, um, uh, questions and, and input uh, to the discussion. But let me also take the chance to thank all the other authors and whoever has uh, attended this academic track session of Phosphor G. Once again, I think uh, um, all the talks we have uh, heard about uh, prove uh, how mature how strong how good uh, phosphor g solutions are uh, to support research in a variety of, of domains this is the, the thing that i really appreciated the most um so uh, if you for to the audience uh, if you if you like the talk please uh, put your hands together in a virtual applause for uh, mariela uh, as i'm doing right uh, now and uh, uh, see you uh, virtually in this uh, uh, exciting Phosphor G2021 uh, and uh, enjoy your uh, afternoon or, or evening or night uh, or day or, or whatever, depending on, on where you are. Thanks a lot and bye-bye. And